Hello, my name is Peter Mackay. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of HCB. And uh, one of the issues that we write about regularly uh, is uh, fires aboard container ships. And what I'm doing today is uh, finding out more from somebody who, who knows more about this than most people I know, and that's Peregrine Stores Fox, uh, Risk Management Director of the TT Club. Peregrine, hello. Hello and um, thank you. Welcome to TT Club and uh, I'm very excited about the opportunity to talk to you about container ship fires, which is a blight for the industry. Is it my uh, imagination or, or are we having more uh, major fires on container ships these days? Uh, there is a long term sort of 20 year average of about six container ship fires, major container ship fires every year. When I say major, I'm talking about a number of containers going on fire and obviously that can range from sort of half a dozen or a dozen through to something like MSC Flaminia or Mare's Conam where you have very major losses uh, that most people in the industry will know about. Um, and that long-term average of six has kind of been exacerbated a little bit this, this year. We've had so far around seven fairly major fires. And it's only last. August. Yeah, it's only August, so that would seem to buck the trend. Whether that is actually going to continue through the rest of the year and actually uh, reflects a material trend is, I think, open to debate. To what extent are, are dangerous goods implicated in, in these fires? I mean, if you say on average of six a year, are they all dangerous goods fires? Virtually all the ones that I am aware of uh, out of that 20 year yeah. History. I suppose it, it's, it sort of goes without saying, if something catches fire, then it's flammable. Absolutely. Uh, and most of them do involve dangerous goods in one way or another as part of the initial fire and or explosion. Uh, and obviously the reality in a container ship hold is that there is an awful lot that can burn. Uh, so even if it is effectively an inert cargo, it doesn't mean that it doesn't add its weight to the fire as it gets going. And some of the fires that we've seen have immense heat where actually steel melts, which is in excess of a thousand degrees. So actually you can imagine that virtually anything in that situation would be burning. And do you have a, a, a handle on how many of these um, incidents have involved dangerous goods that have been improperly or, or declared or gone undeclared altogether? We have done some investigation on specific cases where we have more information uh, and the vast majority of those involve containers that have been undeclared or misdeclared in one way or another. And so that does give rise to the continuing fear in the industry that we are seeing a bigger problem uh, just under the surface, a sort of near miss that each time could be a major conflagration. Because clearly if there's something in a box, you've, you've no idea what it actually is. Once it's sealed, you don't have very much idea. And if it does catch fire, it's very difficult to, to deal with, presumably. Can be. Uh, obviously, it depends on the nature of the commodity in the container um, and where it is uh, on board. So if it's a deck fire, as the latest one over the last weekend was, then that was on deck, as far as I understand, and was actually put out, I believe, by the firefighting capability on board the ship by the crew, which is if you like, a good result, but obviously a bad situation. Remembering the crew aren't actually t trained firefighters and the capability to fight fires on board a ship are inevitably limited. And um, there are certain problem cargoes, I understand, that can be identified in many of these um, incidents. Uh, and people may be familiar with calcium hypochlorite, but what are the other sorts of things that are causing the issues? Uh, common ones and ones that I think quite often are related to issues of non-declaration or misdeclaration would be something like charcoal and we've had at least two fires this year that would appear to be charcoal related and charcoal is a commodity that is um, shall we say interesting with regard to the dangerous goods code because yes it's in the code but it's got what's called a special provision which can exclude that particular cargo from the application of the code in certain circumstances. And it may be that there is an interest in uh, 
seeing that it is outside the code and avoids mm -hmm. the extra checks and documentation and cost that's involved in processing dangerous goods. Is it the case that something like charcoal is also going to be coming from, a, a, say, a, a less uh, formal uh, manufacturer, from, uh, from the informal economy, perhaps? Because we've seen so many charcoal fires, I've spent a little bit of time working with trade data to try to understand where charcoal is shipped from and to. And one thing that is immediately apparent is not only are there half a dozen or so fairly major uh, shipping nations, uh, but also the nature of the charcoal and the production of the charcoal is very different according to the places where it's produced. Obviously, you're talking of different wood as the, the raw product, uh, let alone the process by which that is done. So sometimes, uh, and the UK, for example, when it's producing charcoal, typically it's a fairly uh, proper industrial type process. So there are controls over moisture and heat and all the rest of it. So you know roughly what, what's going on. In some parts of the world, it's literally the local farmer with a little oven uh, who's trying his best to do something, actually ultimately to put a crust on his, on his plate at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And so part of me doesn't want to stop that at all, yeah. obviously. But finding the control point as to how do you know that that particular uh, parcel of charcoal has been properly produced and is in a fit state to be transported uh, is very difficult. So you have to look at the different entities involved through the supply chain in order to identify who is it who has the best control at the point it's going in a container. Well, I don't want to focus too much on calcium hypochlorite because that tends to um, take attention away from, from other dangers. But I do remember, what was it, 10 or more years ago when there was a sudden spate of uh, incidents, big and major incidents, some of them involving calcium hypochlorite. And I think uh, a lot of this is coming out of China. And a lot of that um, produced possibly thousands of kilometres inland by people who have never seen the ocean, never mind the IMDG code. Um, I mean, is that a major factor? Yes, and actually calcium hypochlorite, in my mind, has or teases out a number of the risks involved because you're talking of a chemical that is complex to produce and if it has impurities or there are hiccups in that production which may not be apparent at the time it's put in packaging for transport uh, that can actually add to the dangers then obviously you've got issues around the marking the, the declaration the placarding all the rest of it that becomes part of uh, the transport chain as well as the volume of cargo that can be put in containers so there's good advice put out by SINs and the International Group of P&I Clubs, which tries to identify what is the, well, what are the, the cargo risks, the commodity risks per se, and then how to pack it and how to ensure that it has a reasonable chance of going through the supply chain. Yes. What's, what's that UK P&I Club book? Is it Pack It Right? And book It Right, Pack It Right, which is actually joint P&I and TT. Uh, and we produced an edition uh, for IMDG 3816 mm -hmm. uh, and we're in the process of working out what to do for the latest edition because obviously with IMDG as with the other dangerous goods regulations we're on a two-year cycle. Yes and with the latest amendment I suppose bringing in all this um, the malarkey about polymerizing substances which um, is one of the risks I suppose in having an accident is that you actually end up with more regulation. Do you, think, uh, do you think the IMDG code is clear in what it expects from shippers and, and freight forwarders involved in the polymerising substances supply chain? Well, taking polymerising substances alone, uh, obviously they are themselves quite a, a collection of uh, specific commod uh, commodities, cargo types, uh, and they have specific characteristics that need to be taken account of. And as you'll be well aware, most of this has arisen out of the MSC Flaminia and the, the initial German uh, report on that. And then that actually led to changes uh, in IMDG. And then there have been subsequent changes that come in next January uh, on 38, 20, uh, 39, 18, the right numbers, <laughs> um, which becomes force of law January 2020. Uh, and 
what is interesting around that particular polymerizing cargo was that when it was initially put in the code, it was put in class nine miscellaneous cargoes, which I think is perhaps a, something that itself needs to be uh, considered more carefully with new chemicals as they are classified, actually, how do they get into the right part of the classification? So it was at the time of the incident correctly classified as class nine miscellaneous, whereas it is now classed under 4.2 polymerizing cargo and obviously highly flammable. Uh, so the risks haven't actually changed, but their, the assessment, the classification of those risks has changed. So under the previous classification, there was no reason for it not to be stowed near the bunker tanks. Was there? Uh, yes and no, of course. Okay. <laughs> the judgment from New York about well, September last year uh, actually tees out quite a lot of the issues around that. Uh, and the fact that the shipper was aware of certain characteristics and the forwarder should have been aware of certain characteristics and those should have been made available to the carrier. Yes. So. I think everyone was aware, or everyone in that supply chain was aware that DVB was a pretty nasty cargo and has the propensity to go on fire. What they weren't aware of was uh, the specifics of that particular supply chain and the way that the cargo had been loaded early, was stored in a hot place for a prolonged period before being put on board. And the, being put on board, it was actually uh, at a place which was a longer supply chain than had originally been anticipated. Mm. And if those factors had all been known to the carrier, there might have been a different result, an option to do something differently. Yes, I, I, I use this actually as an example of, of where uh, there's been a failure to manage change. There was a change in the, in the design of the supply chain at that point without actually being uh, properly assessed, I think. Um, so I, uh, there are lessons in that in that incident for uh, that are, have much wider applicability. Yes, absolutely. You mentioned earlier the, there was uh, twenty years worth of um, uh, data on, on this issue. I remember for a long time there was a, um, a lack of action to to address what was what was evidently a growing problem, even if it's only growing because ships are getting bigger and the potential losses are getting bigger. Do you think that's that, that's a fair assessment? Uh, and, you know, what has industry done since to to change things? I think obviously the industry as a whole has continued to change. So, um, for example, the dangerous goods regulations, as I've said, have a two-year cycle, and each year there are new commodities that are added to the listing. Uh, things are changed. The regulations are tweaked. Different elements are put in. Uh, so that is one level of change that has been happening, well, as far as the IMDG code is concerned, since 1965. So there's a long history of change, uh, and that often does come out of incidents. So as we've said about the MSC Flaminia, now there have been two changes arising out of that particular incident. So we do have a learning process uh, that goes back quite a long time. Uh, equally, we mentioned calcium hypochlorite, and there was quite a lot of profile given to that in the 90s as we had a spate of incidents, and that led to advice from uh, the PNI clubs. There was work that went through uh, the IMO, and that has carried on. More recently, perhaps, uh, and perhaps more significantly, uh, the lines have sought to collaborate with regard to safety incidents. And this goes back to about 2011 when CINS, Cargo Incident Notification System Network, was first put in place. Uh, so five major lines got together to uh, work on a more collaborative basis. And that was uh, looking fundamentally at capturing low-level incidents. And for me, this is a major component of trying to learn. So although we have this history of major incidents, for me it's much more significant to get hold of what we might term as near misses or low level incidents that are not just causing disruption but have the potential each time to be a much more major incident. So CINS started to develop this database of incidents and they are continuing to capture those. And it's across the board, it isn't just dangerous goods, it's all type 
uh, of cargo or container right type of incidents that lead to some form of disruption on board or indeed on land. Uh, and that's then analysed to see, well, what can we learn from those? What sort of trends are we seeing? Are we seeing commodities from a particular area of the world giving rise to more of a problem? Or are we seeing whatever it is that needs to be changed in regulation? And then that would go through the, the channels towards IMO. And obviously there are NGOs as well as governments who are responsible for bringing those sorts of initiatives forward. So are there any sort of firm indicators of, you know, sources of hazard? Um, you know, where, where are the risks coming from or what, what, what are they involved? Is, there, is SINSnet throwing up that information yet? Certainly SINS and, and others have, uh, by focusing on some of the more major types of problem commodities, they've been able to list those, and so charcoal, calcium hypochlorite are amongst those inevitably. Uh, things like fish meal uh, also are in there as, interestingly, probably semi-bulk commodities that have now been containerized, which may be part of the indicator of where we're at. And particularly if you think of the history of the IMDG code as starting out as bulk shipment problems. Uh, if you think of a typical bulker, which may have one, two, five, six holds, uh, for each of those holds, you'd have a homogenous cargo, which meant that there was much better opportunity to control uh, what was happening in relation to that cargo. Obviously, it still had to be declared correctly, yeah. but assuming it was declared correctly, then everyone on board knew what was in that part of the ship. Whereas obviously on a container ship, you have thousands of containers in every hold. So the MSC Flaminia or Mesk Honam, in the area of the fire, you're talking of the best part of 3,000 containers that are damaged as a result of the fire. And each one of those not only could have one different commodity, but may, if it's consolidated box, have literally 100 or more commodities in that one container. Yeah. So it's one package within one container, within a hold that can cause those sorts of problems. Is it a different hazard then? Well, if we're talking about the, the, the anonymous box container, 20 foot or 40 foot unit or whatever, which could have anything in and any hazard at all, um, compared to say a tank container, which at least you know is 23,000 litres of liquid, which may or may not be what it says on the outside, but um, it, it's it's almost like there's a, a different level of hazard between the two or a different level of uh, information available, I suppose, at least with a tank container, you know there's something homogenous in there. Yeah, certainly tank containers uh, are generally homogenous and uh, would be uh, more able to be controlled as long as they were on their own. But mm -hmm. once they get in a hold and you've got hundreds of other containers around them yeah. uh, that could be either impacted by some venting or leakage even, uh, or themselves may give an impact to that container. So may in a fire situation that can start somewhere else, but heat up the tank container and cause a problem. Yes, and, and there's, there seems to be a constant um feature of these incidents that um, despite the fact that um, cargo manifests and, and information is, it seems to be available, there is, it's very difficult to get a handle on what's involved in the fire. Um, I'm, uh, is there any prospect that application of digital technologies or new IT might help us in this regard, do you think? I think definitely there's possibility and uh, those who are uh, focused on these sorts of issues, I'm sure will be thinking around how to do that. So mm -hmm. the opportunity in a peer-to-peer -peer type environment in a blockchain world, okay. then that ecosystem by definition should start to provide the validation that is necessary between the different stakeholders and also ensure that any collection of data which is important to someone else can be passed without any interruption or distortion to that person. So in theory, 
digitization does help a lot. Obviously, we're talking about humans being involved in making that work as well. And it, and it depends on the quality of the data that's input into that system. So it, it depends yeah. on proper declaration. Absolutely, full declaration. And we've seen that in some cases where the declaration isn't full or all the information that could have been made available hasn't been passed down the supply chain. Yeah. In a, a blockchain environment, in my dream world, mm. then that information is available mm. and everyone who has an interest in the totality of that information will be able to mm. get hold of what they need in order to make the best possible decisions. It seems to me, if, you, if, you, if this is your dream future, um, that there's an important role for ports to play, port authorities. I've se we've seen lately what the Port of Rotterdam in particular is doing and, and acting as a neutral um, collector of an awful lot of data, including, of course, uh, dangerous goods declarations, because they need to know where this is going in the port. I think possibly we will have to wait for that. And obviously, as an insurer, I only generally see incidents that have happened, so yeah. I'm on the wrong end of the, the <laughs> scale. Uh, I would hope that shippers and the, particularly the chemical industry, because they're the ones who are uh, producing the polymerizing cargoes and therefore have the ability to know A, what their commodity is and B, how best to control it and C, what information needs to be passed on. Uh, they are the ones who control us and hopefully they are becoming better prepared. I like the hopefully, that's... Um... <laughs> well, if they're going to be compliant, they will have to be having that information available. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting sound bites from the MSC Flaminia judgment is the challenge really to the shipper community that says, it isn't just about complying with the code, being compliant with the regulation. Actually, if there's anything else that you think is relevant or you know is relevant to that cargo, yeah. you need to be communicating that down the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And that's quite a powerful message, I think, uh, that needs to get across to the shipper community. Yeah, I suppose what, I'm, what concerns me is that even if shippers are passing information on, then freight forwarders and carriers may not be alert to that um, and they need to be aware that you know, other stuff is coming at them quite apart from the, you know, the, the, the basic particulars of the cargo involved. That's one of the interesting things around uh, more dangerous goods movements in general. So as you'll be aware, the safety data sheets are generally going to be available around the commodity and the way that that's communicated down the supply chain is haphazard, shall we say, yeah. or not consistent. So even where it is communicated, it generally goes with the contractual type documentation, the bill of lading and similar. Whereas for dangerous goods regulations, they have to complete a dangerous goods declaration. And that is used obviously in maritime for ship stowage. Those two documents are currently not compared. And even that would be a relatively simple step in digitization to say, make sure you do have an SDS, make sure you've got the DDD, compare the two and check that there aren't any inconsistencies. Personally, I'm a bit doubtful about the role of the SDS in the transport chain. I can understand that. And of course, transport as an element within the SDS isn't even mandated. I suppose the, the other thing I'd like to talk about is what the, the lines themselves have been doing uh, recently. I, I know, uh, uh, some of them have you know, banned certain goods, fireworks, uh, typically, from, from their ships. Um, others, like Hapag Lloyd, have, have taken a more proactive approach. Um, can you explain more about that? Um, it was a prize-winning idea, wasn't it? Indeed. The TT Club Innovation in Safety uh, Award a couple of years ago was won by Hapag Lloyd in respect of their cargo patrol uh, technology, mm -hmm. and that is technology that is applied at the point of booking and identifies a whole range of synonyms and potential flags that are necessary for further investigation. So if you're you know, wanting to ship blocks of wood, that probably goes through the system fine. If you say that it's something to do with charcoal, and charcoal itself is uh, a commodity that has a number of synonyms, mm -hmm. so you might call it 
bamboo something, right. uh, but it is actually charcoal, that can be flagged in an electronic system, obviously, yeah. but then requires uh, a more human interaction that says, okay, well, tell me more about this commodity. Tell me more about how you're producing it. Uh, produce the SDS. Uh, the other documentation that evidences what you're doing in relation to production, packaging, packing, uh, and all the rest to ensure that it is properly declared. Um, and cargo patrol is an interesting one. Uh, doing a bit of a, a sort of back of an envelope calculation from the statistics that Hamburg Lloyd put out a couple of years ago, it would seem that somewhere in excess of 150,000 boxes per year are more than likely undeclared or misdeclared. And each one of those could be the next major fire. So that's, um, that's Hapag Lloyd. What are, what are the other lines doing? I think broadly, most lines will have some form of booking checking process. Uh, Hapag Lloyd, I believe, have possibly the most sophisticated and as you'll be aware, they sold that technology onto IBM to develop as an industry-wide standard, uh, which I think, from my perspective, would still be a good aspiration because one of the problems is that if you have different methodologies, then almost by definition, someone is going to get caught out. So if it is rejected from line A because of being non-compliant or non-declared, or indeed a lot of the instances where there has been a discussion that leads to the shipper actually saying, well, I'm no longer going to go with that line you're far too difficult to deal with, so I will now book with someone else. That cargo will still move, and if it goes to a line that has a different or potentially uh, less rigorous process, that cargo will be accepted. And of course, with the, the line vessel sharing arrangements, then that cargo could actually end up on the same ship it would have done if line A had accepted it but in an unknown circumstance, yeah. in the sense that although the carrying uh, operator would know the detail that has been provided to them, right or wrong, if it's not declared dangerous goods, that wouldn't be passed through to the actual carrier. So when it comes to storage planning, there will be less information than if mm -hmm. the original carrier had accepted the cargo and uh, had been able to take proper uh, storage provision over it. Which brings us back to the, the thorny topic of, of restrictions for, um, in terms of vessel loading, in terms of um, you know, uh, routing as well. Indeed. And that's another layer of complexity in the, the modern supply chain. So you have a whole raft of different restrictions that are validly applied. So a lot of carriers will say they don't want to carry explosives or they can't carry explosive on board their ships. And that could be to do with the space they have, could be to do with the, the flag state, uh, all sorts of different complexities that say they won't carry a particular type of cargo. Uh, then you've got the physical constraints on board a ship. So in some trades, it may be almost impossible to stow sufficient cargo of a particular type because of the physical constraints uh, on board the ship. So if you've got a combination or you've got a certain number of reefers or whatever, then to be able to do that younger game effectively and keep within uh, all the regulatory requirements can be quite a major task. So you've got the, the sort of basic line policies, you've got the ship physical constraints, and obviously within that you've got the policies of potentially owners and charters as well. Uh, and then you've got the, the port rotations. So on a typical supply chain, you will have a dozen or more ports between the port of loading and the final port of discharge. And each one of those ports will apply their own restrictions to certain cargo, and not just applying to the cargo that's landed or even transshipped, but sometimes to the cargo that is left on board, is not moving at all within the port, but the port uh, says that they will not allow that to go through their ports as a transit at all. And of course, from an operator's point of view, you don't want to get caught out because you don't want your ship delayed because of breaching regulations in any given port. Yeah, that costs money. Costs lots of money and a lot of complexity. I mean, it's something I hear quite a lot from shippers that they um, feel that even when they've properly declared, they're classified and declared and packaged and packed uh, their cargo and, they, and it still won't go. 
Um, and it's almost like it's an encouragement to hide it and, and not declare it. Is there any evidence that that's uh, uh, something that's going on? There's certainly been some evidence historically. Um, so calcium hypochlorite, that's all too popular cargo. Uh, there has been demonstrable evidence that uh, certain shippers and even certain forwarders have said openly, if you call it something else, then it will get through the supply chain rather than calling it calcium hypochlorite. Um, and that is both disappointing and obviously fraudulent criminal, uh, but it's something that is inevitable, I think, where there are restrictions because the cargo, ostensibly at least in a trade, has to move from point A to point Z. Uh, therefore, if there is a restriction on one line or one routing, uh, then either you find another line and another routing, or yes, inevitably human nature will be to try to find uh, something else you can call it. Yes. With fireworks, it used to be children's toys, wasn't it, I think? Yes, I've heard that one. Um, got the lines now looking during the acceptance process at, at, what, at where cargo might be hiding, misdeclared or undeclared. Are they doing anything practical in terms of um, uh, cargo inspection, um, either ahead or during loading? Yes, yes they are. And first you'll be familiar with the IMO mandated government inspection programme, which uh, I've quite frequently said is uh, not sufficiently followed through. So we have a very, very small proportion of cargoes that are or shipments that are checked by governments. They tend to be looking at declared dangerous goods. They tend to be exports rather than imports. Uh, and as you'll be aware, uh, the US do probably 80% of those over the last 20 years. So we, we don't get a proper spread around the globe of uh, random inspections from the governments. Uh, certain lines and particularly the ones related to CINS have uh, this year put in a program, a pilot program to look at certain cargoes and they've done a, a broader selection. So they are looking at imports, they are looking at declared and under, or they're looking at general cargo and declared dangerous goods. Uh, they are looking just at random factors uh, to bring out the, the inspections or bring out the containers for inspection. Uh, and those findings have perhaps unsurprisingly been that much worse in terms of uh, deficiencies found and some fairly major deficiencies found as well. Now that in itself is something that, as you'll be aware, in the last couple of weeks has led to certain lines saying they're going to impose penalties mm -hmm. in relation to what they find at inspection time. And I, I think that's another point of discussion, but there's also the opportunity when something is found to go back to the shipper and work with them. And I know that that does happen with the lines where they find deficiencies, they actually work with the ship from the packer to say, if you do it in this way, it is compliant and we will take your cargo. And that's a much more positive narrative. Yes, and probably easier than trying to winkle $35,000 out of a, a shipper who, who hasn't complied. It may be a both and. And of course, the, I've said to many lines over the years that they have the bill of lending conditions that allow them already to charge such penalties and the provisions also to enforce some level of collection. It becomes a commercial matter, obviously, as to how they do that. Uh, and we don't need to go there, but yeah. the provisions are already in place. Uh, and to see them being used or being announced that they will be used as a deterrent is actually a very positive move. Okay and does bolster any inspection program that says, not only are we going to inspect cargo and potentially have that discussion as to how to ensure that compliance is achieved for future, but also actually go back to the shipper and say, well, you are going to be charged for this one. It has actually cost us more to do the inspection 
to take that container out of a supply chain, do all sorts of additional checks. So there are costs that the lines are incurring. So in that sense, it's not unreasonable that they have some sort of penalty mechanism to recoup those costs. Do you think that uh, inspection program will, will continue? Is that going to be an ongoing uh, policy? Certainly the lines that have been closely involved in it have found positive benefits and I believe they are wanting to continue. Okay. Well, I suppose if they are finding misdeclared cargo, then that's a potential incident saved. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think that where they've found that and the opportunity to work with ships and packers proactively, uh, not only is it preventing the risk uh, materialising, but also it's helping to improve the entire supply chain. Yeah. Because whilst we see these as ship fires, every one of these could be a fire in a port area, and we've seen those, or it could be a single incident on a road or railway. And each of those, in terms of the, the entirety of the supply chain, is of significance. Um, we spoke earlier about the, the role of TT Club and um, as, as uh, an insurer, but also there's a great deal of knowledge and expertise within the club. And obviously it's in your interest to, to reduce the uh, number and severity of container ship fires. What, what's TT done um, to, to help its members, let's say, uh, address these issues? Well, I guess the first point is that over the years, TT Club, amongst a number of other insurers, have taken a lot of effort to publicise incidents and try to uh, show what good practice looks like, uh, whether it's in guidance, the book it right, pack it tight type documentation that says here is something important for you to take account of. And we have our own publications, what we call stop loss publications, and also some handbooks that look at a variety of the risks that we've seen. So we look to uh, extract the information that we're getting on the claim side and play it back with some additional advice. So that's a, a general uh, process that's been going on for, for years. Um, more recently, uh, TT Club has been collaborating with other industry partners to try to promote good practice in terms of cargo packing. And we call this cargo integrity or hashtag fit for freight, uh, which is trying to identify there is uh, a fitness to put things in the freight supply chain. Uh, and where that happens, then things can be expected to have a good outcome. Where they're not done consistently, uh, then there can be problems. And that in applies not just to dangerous goods and the specifics around declaration or marking, placarding, or the rest of it, but around basic uh, ways that cargo is packed, whether it's eccentrically loaded, whether it's properly secured. Uh, obviously, humidity can impact uh, packaging, and that needs to be taken account of depending on the journey that's going on. So we particularly go back to the CTU code, which the IMO, yeah. ILO, UNECE agreed uh, through their processes in 2014. And that isn't the first time, obviously. There have been lots of iterations of guidance that have been put through internationally. But this is now a code which has a bit more legal significance and becomes, if you like, the, the broad framework under which everything can be operating. So we're looking to promote the CTU code uh, and help people not just to be aware of it, but learn how to comply with the elements that are appropriate to the commodity or the packing that they are undertaking in order to uh, give a good outcome to the supply chain. And do you think shippers are sufficiently aware of the CTU code? I think generally the industry as a whole is not sufficiently aware and that's partly why it's a collaborative effort. So we work with the Global Shippers Forum, so trying to get into the shipper community, uh, shipper associations and shippers of particular commodities. We're working with Ichika, uh, who are obviously looking more specifically at the port and terminal interface, working with World Shipping Council and then recently this year we started working with CINS as well, drawing their uh, influence in, and loosely also with some of the uh, competent authorities and other NGOs who are interested in shipping. So what we're hoping to do by building a sort of broad stakeholder group 
who have a common vision to empower uh, the message so that more people understand actually it is important and it's important to all the stakeholders, both directly involved in the supply chain and indirectly. And I think indirectly is one of the interesting parts of our, our outreach. Uh, so earlier this year, we were talking to customs authorities and saying, actually, when you see something that causes you concern on the customs side, mm -hmm. it quite often is going to be causing concern on the safety side. So let's start to have a bit more of a dialogue instead of this sort of silo approach, mm -hmm. try to understand actually if something's going, gone wrong here, it's more than likely going to go wrong somewhere else for some other stakeholder who may not be involved in the direct trade supply chain, uh, but will have an influence over the way things are done. And that's been quite a useful dialogue. And I think there are a number of other uh, initiatives that we can take to try to deconstruct the supply chain and understand what the levers are and how we can put it back together in a way that increases the likelihood of good behavior for every stakeholder through the supply chain. So, and, and if we can do that, then you will hoover up the dangerous goods as well. Absolutely. Dangerous goods are inherently part of mm -hmm. the entirety, mm -hmm. and it depends who you talk to as to what level that is. I think the, the normal benchmark is around 10% of maritime cargo is declared dangerous goods. And of course, the sort of elephant in the room is how much of it is going through that's not declared. And if that was another 10%, that is quite significant. So it seems to me that you've got uh, all the ducks lining up now. You've got the insurers, you've got the ship, um, shippers, ship owners, ports and terminals. Can we look forward to an improvement in the... Um, in the, in the record of, of uh, container ship fires and dangerous goods incidents at sea, do you think? I would hope that in the medium term, yes, we can. Uh, we all understand that this is a very complex uh, business, the supply chain and the, the number of different stakeholders and the attitudes to the way that cargo is uh, put into the supply chain. Uh, and therefore, I don't for a moment underestimate how much we're needing to talk to different people and how long it may take. And it may well be well past our retirement before we actually see a material change. But yeah. I still feel that it's worth getting this ball into the game uh, and trying to make a difference because future people will actually see a benefit. I'm glad to hear it. Peregrine, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Peter. Good speaking.